we're live. All right. Okay, 7.30 on the nose. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us tonight at our delayed virtual Cranbrook meeting for the month of September. This is one of those weird weeks where we have a Cranbrook meeting and a Macomb meeting in the space of four days. So we'll be seeing you all again very soon. Uh, got a bit of a lengthy report tonight, so I'll kick off with that. I am, of course, your president for the year, Diane Hall. And uh, first off, I'd like to express thanks to all of you who supported me and Jonathan last month at the passing of John's father. Uh, to say that that was difficult is an understatement, but it was good to see you all at the uh, memorial. Thank you very much. Um, something that we don't often mention when we talk about our origin story as astronomers was that uh, my father-in-law was the person who instilled Jonathan with a deep love of nature. And when we bought our first telescope in 2006, shortly before wandering into the auditorium at Cranbrook in search of an astronomy club, the intent was for all three to use it up north. Uh, so John's dad, uh, I don't think he ever got it out on his own, but certainly whenever we had it out, he'd take a look at Saturn, Jupiter, etc. And uh, over the last couple of years, we tried to give him a, a good show whenever we were up there. Also, thanks to everybody who attended the swap meet. That was our first face to face event since the Marsh Cranbrook meeting last year uh, with vaccines for kids potentially on the horizon. Hopefully it is not our last face to face meeting of any kind this year. Uh, once we've got those vaccines rolled out for the under 12s, we hope to be able to resume activities at Stargate complete with scout groups and open houses with kids. We are coasting toward the end of the year and the board has several things that need the input of you, the members. First off, we are always pleased to put together a magnificent calendar of member images and drawings. If you would like to serve in the calendar committee to help create this year's calendar, please let the board know. If you have an image to submit or several images, please send it to publications at warrenastro.org. Remember, you do not need a super expensive uh, photography setup to take excellent pictures. Um, there's fantastic cell phone pictures, weather images of planetary astronomy here on Earth do count. So send them our way. We are also in the process of selecting this year's service award winners. So that would be the Hands on Bob Watt Award, the Outreach Centric Blaine McCullough Award, the Club Infrastructure Larry Kalinowski Award, and the Lee Searle, E. John Searles Award, the you know ultimate honor that we hand out. Uh, if you have nominations for excellent service during this very odd year where we didn't get to do much face to face, please let the board know. Um, because we would like to recognize everybody, even if we weren't in a position to personally, you know, see it at a astronomy at the beach or what have you. Next month is the deadline to be on the nomination committee for this year's officer elections. A reminder that every office is up for, you know, the choosing, but we do have outreach chair Bob Tremblay is termed out after a phenomenal, unprecedented three years in a row. So Bob is hanging out of the outreach hat for the time being. We need a new outreach chair. Uh, also, as some of you know, um, Riyadh has um, uh, is working often out of town. Um, th as much as he loves our Stargate and the Kalinowski Cooler Refractor, he's not in a position to continue as observatory chairman. And so that will definitely be up for grabs. Um, if interested, right now, email Dr. Dale Parton at firstvp at warrenaster.org. If you wish to join the nomination committee, let us know. If you wish to stand for office, email Dale. And uh, once we've got a committee together, you know, email them. Okay, we've got two employment opportunities of interest. <laughs> One of them at Plain Wave. Uh, we have an ad in the WASP. So if you don't subscribe to the WASP, 
which you should. It's up on our website, so check that out. The other is at Cranbrook. They are looking for a part-time weekdays, weekends, combination planetarium observatory position. I'm going to post that right here. So check that out if you'd like to get a little bit closer to Cranbrook's very expensive equipment. <clears throat> and finally, next virtual Cranbrook. So October 4th is going to be a special private screening online of a film instead of a live presentation with a speaker. We will offer you a different registration link for the evening. We will not do a live stream. The only way to enjoy next month's Cranbrook meeting will be to join us here on the WebEx. We will make it very clear in the email blast and on the meetup page that that's the situation, but just wanted to let you all know WebEx only for next Cranbrook meeting only. Does not affect Macomb four days from now. What's the that's, title of the movie? Diane? It's called Luminous, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> and with that, I'll hand things over to Dr. Dale Parton. Okay, thank you, Diane. Um, at our next meeting, uh, this Thursday, September 16, Tony, Tony Licata <laughs> will give the main presentation. His topic will be the Hamburg meteor. Then, as you heard Diane mention a moment ago, on October the 4th, we will have Sam Smart of Calvin University uh, presenting us with a special video presentation or video called Luminous. It has to do with whether one can predict when a star will explode. Uh, seems to be a, a new theory that perhaps, at least in some circumstances, one can predict that. We will see. Um, beyond that, um, I'm always looking for speakers. Please don't be shy. Um, you don't have to have the, the presentation all done. We're talking about Five or six months from now, we need speakers. We're booked up through the rest of this year and some of January and February, but so you got plenty of time, but it would really help if you think you might have some, let me know and we'll pick a date that works for you and a tentative title and we'll go from there. So please let me know if you think you might have something. Back to you, Diane. All right. Thank you, Dale. That's a timely reminder. I have something I would like to present next year that I need to email Dale about. And with that, over to Riyadh at Observatory. Thank you, Diane. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, the Observatory and uh, uh, the dab shed and all equipment are in good condition. Uh, I've uh, been there. Uh, a few times uh, uh, recently, I've been there on the 28th when we had the um, uh, the swap, and as well as uh, the following uh, day, because uh, Marty uh, also wanted to work on um, a radio telescope um, that uh, he's worked on before. Um, so everything is in good shape. And um, next. Uh, Open house. We did have a, an open house that night. Anyhow, it was a virtual open house uh, through Dark Box uh, Northern Cross Observatory. Uh, the next open house uh, is coming up uh, on the uh, 25th of this month. Um, and uh, once again, if uh, Doug is going to be in town and available, uh, we may have also um, a virtual open house again. Um, so that's to be determined. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> To be determined, and and if there will be one, um, then you can you can join uh, the same way that uh, you have been basically on the same uh, link that he has uh, set up before. Um, the uh, swap meet went uh, well for what it was. Uh, we had uh, roughly about a dozen people or so. 
um, and it lasted, uh, I don't know, maybe about a couple hours or a little bit more. Uh, it was good to see a few people that came out there. Most everybody was wearing a mask and followed the, the, the rules that we kind of uh, asked people would follow. Um, and I think it was okay. So hopefully, as Diane mentioned, uh, once um, uh, maybe we uh, we have some assurances that uh, kids are going to be all right once they start uh, getting their vaccines. I'm hoping that we can get back and in, into at least to Stargate and observing the fields are uh, the field is open out there anyhow. If you want to go out there with your own scope, so you're all welcome to do that. Uh, but the building is uh, the observatory is still closed at, uh, at this time for in person observing. Um, that's all I have uh, at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Riyadh. And over to Mark Kedzier, our secretary, with an update on the telescope project at Ferndale. Hi, Diane. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I, uh, Ferndale Public Library purchased three uh, Orion Star Blast reflectors, and uh, they were they want to be active participants in the library telescope program. So. Uh, I will be actually going there tomorrow to begin the modification process for them. And uh, they're looking at an October launch of the program. And hopefully to coincide uh, uh, October, we have an event called Observe International Observe the Moon Night. So that's a very easy object for to get that library telescope zoomed in on and it would be a, uh, a great thing to, to launch their program. So. They start be doing the uh, modifications starting tomorrow. We'll get them all done. Just going to go through bits and pieces. And then uh, Jordan, uh, who is uh, going to be uh, kind of like the point person for the library telescope program there. He happens to be on family leave. He had a, a newborn addition to his family, and he will return back to work September 27th and plenty of time to launch the telescope program at Ferndale. So that's all I have right now. And the minutes are, of course, in the WASP. Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, Adrian, do I see it? There's Adrian. Adrian yep. at Treasury. Yep. Well, um, I've been working on Treasury stuff, and uh, we have two new members that I am currently processing right now, and we'll be sending out um, new membership emails to and also our um insurance from west bend came up it turns out there is an online option which i found that i used last time so i have gone ahead and paid that amount um our insurance amount comes to 1171 bucks and the uh, board approved that payment we have paid it in full as of about 30 minutes ago it was due in october um, I think it was October 10th, but um, so we're ahead of we're ahead of that as usual. I think the last few payments um, we have a history of being well ahead, a month ahead of um, due dates. So we've taken care of that. So those those are the two big things I have from a treasurer standpoint. Um, from an AL League standpoint, um, observers handbooks and calendars are available to order and we can do bulk orders with clubs the handbooks are 16 dollars, and the calendars are 21 dollars. if anyone is interested in a bulk order uh, of the the handbook or the calendar and i can i'm well i can't show you the handbook because of the way i'm using my uh my was i'm blurring everything out for myself but the observer's handbook is available and calendar. If interested, um, send an email and I'll put it in chat to treasure at warrenastro.org. And um, you can, if there's enough interest, I can put a bulk order in to order at the, at the uh, prices uh, 16 and 21. Otherwise, it's basically $10 more for each if you do a separate order on your own. Um, unless, if you're a RASC member or you order in bulk, the idea is that they want to get more people, um, more U.S. clubs ordering the RASC, um, 
ordering the rask um paraphernalia the uh handbooks the calendars they're trying to make it easier for us clubs to get a, get a hold of those things so that's it from a um the al and as far as GLAC, which i think if bob is here he can cover we are doing the we did send out an email blast for the um astronomy at the beach which will be live um live view observing so um that's coming up in two weeks the 24th and the 25th but we're not featuring guest speakers this time um we are featuring just the telescopes the um the live views and any programs if others want to put on a program um we are more than happy to um to facilitate that so in chat i'm going to put two things um the website for black as well as my email address so for the um the astronomical league um interest in that you send my email address for uh interest in attending the live views um you go to www.glack.org with that, that's it for my uh, three pronged report. All right, thank you, Adrian. And over to Bob at Outreach. All right, I just posted the Astronomy at the Beach Facebook event. And uh, so if, if anybody's on Facebook, go ahead and click on that and uh, just say if you're interested or not, we need, we need, we need more people uh, liking that or whatever. Um, as for Outreach, um, Adrian has been, or at least until recently, has been doing his weekly thing with Explore Scientific. I think, are you still doing that? Are you continuing? I am. This That's next awesome. One com the next one coming up is going to be a celebration of John Dobson. So I may be on the panel, but I won't have a specific presentation. I didn't have one last week. Um, they had others. Um, others did presentations. I basically took a break. I had been doing them for almost three months straight. Um, and this one, Scott Roberts wants to focus on John, the life and times of John, Do of John Dobson. So, so I'll be in the panel, but, um, it's going to be more, it, I still recommend you go explore scientific.com slash live and view it, especially for those of us that use Dobsonian telescopes. Um, it's going to be a celebration of the inventor um, for which the uh, mount has been named. So, if someone could put that link in chat, that'd be great. Also, I will Ken, do that. Ken, thank you, Ken Burton. On Wednesday night, on his uh, Facebook feed, he is doing an astronomy thing, which has been fairly popular. So, these guys are putting me to shame. I should be doing something on a weekly basis, but I'm not. Um, <laughs> Other than that, uh, yeah, Glack had a meeting, Astronomy at the Beach, uh, said we are doing it online. Uh, we have a, we have a couple people um, uh, scheduled to do remote telescopes, and we may be getting a remote telescope from the Southern Hemisphere, which would be very cool if we could pull that off. Um, also, um, we are... Um, we're going to be, jeez, uh, I totally derailed my train of thought here. Astronomy at the beach. Um, we are going to be doing presentations. Uh, if you're interested in in giving a presentation and you have a Zoom link and you want to you want to give a presentation, let me know. I'm I'm probably going to be giving a Kerbal Space Program and a tour of the solar system thing. I'm not sure when yet. I want I don't want to stomp on anybody else that might be giving a presentation. So if if you're interested in giving a presentation online during astronomy at the beach, uh, let me know and I'll get it on the schedule. Um, other than that, that is pretty much for outreach. Thank you, Bob. And last but not least, award-winning editor of our award-winning newsletter, Dale Teamy. Uh, thank you, Diane. The uh, award-winning newsletter for uh, the month of September has already been posted, as everybody <laughs> probably knows. <laughs> Meanwhile, um, the next issue for October is underway, and it's looking like it's shaping up pretty good as well. And, the and that would be my report. Right. Somebody has got a mic open. Mike yeah. Mike Best has got the mic open. Mike Best, turn off your mic. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I can't yeah, I even. I can't get it back on. It well, says it's to, muted, and yet he's talking. What is going on here? He's got two connections going. Oh. Yeah, he does. You have probably Ooh. an iPad or something. Mike Best. Yes, yeah. your your video feed is muted, but you must have something else connected. Yeah, where I, we're hearing. I pushed the wrong button, and now I can't. Find... Why don't you log out and log back in? Ooh. Okay, let's see. Give that a okay, well, Mike Best is taking care of that. Uh, on to special interest groups. I don't see Solar Marty. Um, I looked at the sun with a couple of mild sunspots a few weeks ago, as it was chronicled in my field of view this time around. Uh, if anybody's got a picture of the sun, cool. Otherwise, I'll throw things over to Riyadh for double stars. I got a couple things on the sun in my uh, in the news thing. Awesome. Okay, yeah. yeah, so for uh, double stars, uh, this is a uh, actually in, in the fall, it's a decent time of the year uh, to start looking for some of the double stars that are um, in the winter sky, which normally it's pretty cold. Um, and uh, you have a, a lot of uh, turbulence in the atmosphere, but uh, right now you can catch them if you stay up um, late enough or early enough in the morning. Uh, to observe some of those uh, doubles, um, looking especially like around Orion, there are uh, a lot of uh, multiple stars that are good to observe. So that would be my recommendation. And of course, until we um, get back into in-person observing, where we have usually our list uh, that we go through uh, based on uh, the time of the year, um, the next time we have uh, a virtual uh, open house uh, through maybe Doug Fox, uh, Another cross observatory when it becomes available again. Um, usually, uh, you can ask uh, for uh, objects uh, to look for, and um, if they're available and the scope can reach them, uh, Doug usually um, uh, will will move the scope to observe these objects. Thank you. Thank you, Riyadh. And discussion group, of course, uh, replaces the digital open house on cloudy nights. Um, I believe uh, Adrian pretty well covered astronomical league type stuff in his report already. Mm. History group, anything of note? Uh, nothing to see here. Move along, move along. <laughs> okay, Glack, any other things to add? Well, if you have something, Bob, otherwise. No, it's just that if any of the membership would like to give a presentation, give me. All right, and astrophotography. Is uh, Bill Beers here? Bill? I didn't see him. Doug Bach is raising his hand. Yeah. Doug Bach. Doug. I'll just give you a report from. Uh, yes, please. The, from the uh, Great Lakes Stargaze, if you don't mind. Take it away. Okay, so. <clears throat> That was this last week. I went up Monday. We had three and a half clear nights uh, to work on imaging out of uh, the seven that I was there. And we had uh, several people from the Warren Club there, uh, Bill Beers included. Um, the only astrophotography I, I've got processed since I only just got home this afternoon <laughs> is I got one one image that uh, I, I could uh, show you if you'd like. So. From from the star party itself. Yes, please. So this is the um, you guys see that. Sure do. Okay, so this is uh, the Deerlick group, NGC seventy three thirty one, and all the little fleas as they call them, and Stefan's quintet over here. And that was taken the the second night I was there. I haven't processed my first or third nights yet. <clears throat> if you want to do some astrophotography, um, some of these events like the Great Lakes Stargaze uh, once a year or other star parties that are um, that we have, uh, it's a good time to learn from others on on how to acquire those those uh, uh, these objects and and do some. Basic processing. I've actually got a couple of videos on basic processing. <clears throat> Excuse me on my YouTube channel. Uh, next month, 
I believe for the Okie Tech Star Party down on the western panhandle of Oklahoma. So I expect to get uh, a chance to do some uh, more southerly objects uh, from that location. And it's a darker location than any place I've got here. I will be going with you, Doug, and there's a few of us from uh, Astronomy Group University Lowbrows that are uh, anxiously looking forward to that trip. Yep. Uh, Roger Tanner, who used to be a member of the Warren Club and the Lowbrows, is going to be joining me as a uh, on the trip. So we're going to be nice. We're going to be leaving on the 29th from his house and uh, hopefully get there uh, the night of the 30th, prepared to get in line at the gate uh, the now following morning. All right. Now, it says that basically segued from uh, astrophotography right into observing. Do we have some more observing reports? I see David's hand up. David. You're, you're muted. Are you muted? Uh, are you muted, David? Still muted. What's going on here? David, oh, you have to unmute. Now. Oh, there, now you There we go. Now we're good. Sorry about the delay. I will pay for the parking ticket. And um, the sun has been very, very active lately. Uh, I think the record number of sunspots that I saw was the day before yesterday with six groups and it was over 60 sunspots. And uh, this is very exciting that the sun is really starting to wake up after a long sleep during solar minimum and uh jupiter of course is just beautiful which brings me to the uh to the poems it's such a i'm not sure how hot it is where you are but it's pretty hot today here in arizona wendy and i are enjoying the 104 degree thanks wendy 104 degree temperatures here so i think this would be a good time to go back to the famous a uh, Canadian poet um, <clears throat> who wrote The Cremation of Sam McGee. And Sam McGee was from Tennessee, wanted to go up and to the Klondike and search for gold, but he wasn't prepared for the cold and he got froze to death. But before he died, he, he asked his, um, he asked the writer to, um, uh, to, to, Cremate him if he didn't make it. And uh, I'm picking up the poem where the writer is actually starting to do that. I do not know how long in the snow I wrestled with grisly fear, but the stars came out and they danced about ere again I ventured near. I was sick with dread, but I bravely said, I'll just took a look, take a look inside. I guess he's cooked and it's time I looked Then the door I opened wide. And there sat Sam, looking cool and calm in the heart of the furnace roar. And he wore a smile, you could see a mile, and he said, please close that door. It's fine in here, but I greatly fear you let in the cold and storm. Since I left Plum Tree down in Tennessee, it's the first time I've been warm. There are strange things done in the middle of the sun by the men who wanted for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. More than lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that light on the marge of Lac Lamarge. I cremated Sam McGee. Thank you, and back to you, Diane. That's memorable. <laughs> David, thank happy you, uh, New Year, by the way. Oh, thank you, and, and uh, to all of you as well, may you be inscribed in the Book of Life for a very peaceful and much better year. And the one we're just concluding. Thank you for the lovely blessing. Any other observing reports before we hand things over to? Uh, okay, I see Dale. Dale Hollenbach. Excited about this. Yeah. So something that I've been attempting for a while is to view, or to more accurately say, image, um, Amalthea. Jupiter's largest moon, and I think I've finally done it. So, here's an image that um, can, 
can you guys see my screen? <laughs> yes. Okay. So I, I was imaging Jupiter and the moons here, and I got this bit of data. And it's like, is it yes or no? So I ran the Jupiter tool, and it's like, it's in the right spot. Let me do things again, try to focus a little better, find another day when it's out on the limb here, you know, at farthest away. So, and clear night also. So here's another try that I did where Amalia was pretty far away. And I ran it through, got more data, and here's here's so, in more. I got um, less processed, I should say. Here's a little bit of a smudge, but when I ran it through wavelets and heavy signal processing, I had a lot of data right there. And I am pretty certain that that is a Maltia. So I'm going to do another attempt and try to get uh, even more data on it to get it to get it brighter. So I've been I've been trying that a number of times. Um, I also collimated my telescope and cleaned it, which I think has helped. Um, I got a pretty clear view here of you know the four Galilean moons and Jupiter. Uh, this is with no Barlow. This is prime focus, so that's because I couldn't get all the moons in otherwise with my small sensor. Um, and during opposition here, I made a little animation when I with the moon there. I'm not sure if I've if people have seen it. I I did post one of those pictures in the Wasp, so that's a fun little uh, GIF for four or five images there. So, but I've been focusing on Jupiter this past month, and uh, I've gotten uh, I've gotten some. Some good stuff. So that's my observed report. Thank you. And uh, let's turn it over to Bob Tremblay for tonight's news break. Can, can we get Mike Best to stop that? Thing? I just uh, texted it, him, no. Ken. I'm going to see if Dale can uh, can nuke that, that audio feed. Thanks. Excuse me. Yes. It's Mike. Am I causing a problem? Should I just sign off? You're you're signed in twice, so one is muted, one is not, and we're hearing you. I don't know. I just muted him again. So. All right. Awesome. Thank we're you, good. Dale. Let's carry on. Okay. Can you see my in the news screen? Okay. So um. This this picture uh, on the title screen here is from the high rise uh, probe uh, orbiting Mars, and what they're doing this is a scarp, and they're monitoring changes. Uh, the scarp is exposing massive ground ice, and they're monitoring it for sublimation and observing seasonal frost and stuff like that. So I just thought that was a pretty spectacular picture to start this with. So. Um, yeah, the Mars Perseverance rover is moving and digging, and uh, it left a first sample. So that's pretty cool. Um, the Mars helicopter is flying. It went on its, what, uh, 13th flight now. So it's uh, it's scouting ahead. And what I, what I found is interesting is the Chinese are uh, designing uh, a helicopter. And this one is not going to have solar panels. It's going to be recharged by its rover. So. Gonna, gonna like to see how that is actually going to work. In two days, the scheduled launch of the Inspiration 4 mission, which is going to have four civilian crew members. First four all, all civilian crew member is going to launch on a SpaceX. So that is due to launch on September 15th, Wednesday. Looking forward to that. Um, <clears throat> the uh, James Webb Space Telescope has finished uh, testing and is on its way to the launch site. Very excited about that, finally. Um, the Lucy mission is scheduled to launch on October 16th. Uh, Brother Guy has actually been invited as a uh, VIP to that launch. I tried I tried to see if uh, I could go there too as a solar system ambassador thing, but uh, apparently because of COVID, NASA is not holding any in-person events like that. So Brother Guy is a very VIP, I guess. 
So the Lucy mission is going to visit uh, asteroids, uh, Trojan asteroids around Jupiter. So uh, these these are pretty interesting beasts. Here's an animation of where they are. They uh, they they orbit uh, 60 degrees ahead and behind of Jupiter, uh, and uh, they just kind of hang there, which is kind of interesting. And so this probe is going to go investigate several asteroids in this this grouping. Now, as this is a bit of astronomical research. I had the opportunity to post on the Vatican Observatory site, and we do a newsletter every two weeks, and uh, new research papers come out. This one is a short period variable star. This, oh, geez, MG1688432 has been discovered to exhibit occasional extremely high energy optical outbursts as high as 10 to the 38th erg. I'm not really sure what to compare that with, but the outbursts are typically several hours in duration. And the binary star is a K3 subgiant with a very close red dwarf companion. There's a 6.6 .6 day sinusoidal light curve, but they are not an eclipsing binary system. So this is the 17, if you want to read more on this, the 17 page PDF is available on that on the video site. Um, so in the sky, um, so yeah, speaking of the video, I write a weekly in the sky post for them. And when I do that, I use Stellarium. And so I fired it up this morning and to do to do pictures for my post tomorrow. And I noticed that, you know, here, Venus and Mercury are, are in the Western sky at sunset and Mercury gets lower every day. But Venus, however, does something pretty interesting. So interesting, I made a movie out of it. So here's what Venus does. It just kind of, hangs there in the southwest and then it goes back up and around and down and i said holy mackerel i've never seen it do that before so i i, I created an ephemeris using uh stellarium and and that that is that is what venus is doing now remember this frame is slowly moving down that way so that that's what venus is doing over the next couple of months but i thought that was pretty interesting so the moon is uh, in uh, the the south southwestern sky after sunset right now, and uh, over the course of the next couple of days, it's going to be intruding in on Jupiter and Saturn. So it's going to have a conjunction with both of them, and then move on over the next couple of days. Um, it's going to be full. On, did I have that down there? Ah, well. The 19th. This is the inner solar system. The Parker Solar Probe is uh, coming around to uh, its next apogee. No, aphelion, not apogee. It's uh, orbiting the sun. Um, Comet 67P is coming up on its periapsis pretty soon. You can see it better on that one. So, and there's the outer solar system. I just highlighted Uranus because I never do. But I mentioned I'm going to be talking about the sun. There's the sun today. And you can see there's some sunspots on the edge. They're rotating out of view. Now, seen in uh, a different frequency, you can see a very angry orange spot down there where those sunspots are. And there's very angry yellow spots in the corona there. So the sun is very active, as, as David said, and it's good to see. We, uh, earlier, when I when I posted last week, there were just sunspots covering the face of the sun. So this is the moon this week. Uh, this is going to after sunset uh, up until full. It's going to be perfect for doing uh, outreach in the uh, evenings if you can get your telescope out. Next week, heading into the morning uh, morning times. Our current asteroid count is up up over a million and we've got uh coming up on 27,000 near earth objects and this potentially hazardous asteroid number has been growing quite a bit lately and it's making me a little uncomfortable that was that was down low and that then it numbers ticking up quite a bit now, the exoplanets are I, I report on the current exoplanet count my in the sky post every week and it inc the number increases every week and it would not surprise me if this number is increasing every single day so we've got over 4500 known exoplanets and that's just really cool so uh in a, in a shameless plug i i host the vatican observatory's podcast and uh we uh we had Connie on as a guest uh, a couple weeks ago. We recorded this while we were on vacation up in the Upper Peninsula, so catch that if uh, if you can. And that's in the news and in the sky for this week. Clear skies all. All right, thank you, Bob. So and I will stop sharing. I will now turn things over to 
Dale, or rather both Dales. As soon as I can stop sharing. As soon as Bob can stop sharing. There it is. I knew it was there somewhere. Stop. Okay. Um, tonight, our, we have a short presentation authored by Gary Ross, Clayton Carey, and Dale Teamy. Um, Gary Ross is well known to us for his many presentations and his rather eccentric style of speaking, shall I say. Um, unfortunately, Gary is unable to be with us this evening. Uh, he was the one who initially discovered the lecture you're about to hear by Edwin Hubble. Uh, it was given to the New York Philharmonic in 1945. Uh, Clayton Carey is a good friend of Gary and is sort of go-to guy for IT help. Uh, Clayton was instrumental in getting access to the recording for us from the New York Philharmonic. Clayton, like Gary, is active in the Grand Rapids Amateur Astronomical Association. And the third uh, author tonight is our own Dale Teamy, who is, of course, our publication chairman. And I couldn't pass by the opportunity <laughs> to mention again that he notably was recently awarded by the Astronomical League with the prestigious Mabel Stearns Newsletter Award for his work as editor of the WASP. A lot of us read the WASP, but if you don't, you really should. I mean, if you get a Sky and Telescope or Astronomy Magazine, one or the other of them, you should also look at the WASP, okay? There's some really good stuff in there. Um, so Dale took the audio recording that we got from the New York Philharmonic and uh, sort of jazzed it up with some pictures that you'll be seeing. Um, uh, we can, you know, unfortunately, we can no longer hear a lecture by people like Copernicus or Galileo or Kepler, even if we could understand their language. Um, but tonight, Rather surprisingly, uh, we will hear. Somebody's uh, got their mic open and talking. Uh, Jerry, so, Jerry Voorhees. Okay. Uh, we will hear Hubble speaking just 16 years after he discovered the expansion of the universe back in 1929. Judge for yourselves. It's I've I've listened to this recording several times. It's interesting to listen for what he sounds confident about and what he's sort of not completely committed to uh, based on his discovery. Uh, what did he think the size of the universe was? Um, how accurately did he know the size back then? So, um, again, somebody's got an open mic going. I think it just got zapped. <laughs> uh, and with that, Dale, Timmy, take it away. Astronomy is the study of the universe the study of its structure and its behavior. From our home on the earth, we look out into the dim distances and we strive to imagine the sort of world into which we are born. We are confined to the earth. Our knowledge of outer space is derived from light waves and other radiations, which come flooding in from all directions. From time immemorial, men studied the heavens with their unaided eyes. Finally, about three centuries ago, the telescope was invented. With the growth and development of these giant eyes, the exploration of space has swept outward in great waves. Today we explore with a telescope a hundred inches that is more than eight feet in diameter. 
It has the light gathering power of more than 200,000 human eyes. We observe a volume of space so vast that it may be a fair sample of the universe itself. Men are already attempting to infer the nature of the universe from the study of this sample. The explorations fall into three phases. The first phase led long ago to a picture of the solar system, the sun with its family of planets, including the earth, isolated and lonely in space. Then after several centuries had passed, a picture of a stellar system began to emerge. This was the second phase. The sun was found to be merely a star, one of several thousand million stars, which together form our stellar system, a swarm of stars drifting through space as a swarm of bees drifts through the air. This From was our the position second within phase. the system. The we sun was found to be merely a star, past one of several thousand in million universes, stars, which beyond. together form our Contrast stellar system. This outer space a swarm of the stars third and most through space, space of the as a swarm of bees drifts the outer the regions air. are empty for the most part this was our the position second within the system there, scattered the sun was found to be merely a star we now have one of several thousand in the universe and you were hearing top our stellar system a swarm of the stars and most recent swarms of stars are the true inhabitants of the universe they are so remote that in general we cannot distinguish their individual stars. The swarms appear merely as vague, cloudy patches of light and were called by the name nebulae, the Latin word for clouds. A few of the nebulae appear large and bright. These are the nearest to swarms. Then we find them smaller and fainter in constantly increasing numbers, and we know that we are reaching out into space farther and ever farther until with the faintest nebulae that can be detected with the greatest telescope, we reach the frontiers of the observable region. This glimpse of space, thinly populated by drifting swarms of stars, has been revealed by great telescopes, and in particular by the greatest of all those in actual operation, the 100-inch reflector of the Mount Wilson Observatory. It was the 100-inch that first detected individual stars and a few of the nearest nebulae and identified among them several types of stars that are well known in our own system. Since the real brightness or candle power of such stars had already been measured in our system, their apparent faintness indicated their distances and consequently the distances of the nebulae in which they lay. Once the essential clue of the distances was found, the mystery of the nebulae was quickly solved. They are, in fact, huge stellar systems like our own system, and they appear small and faint only because they are vastly remote. Some nebulae are giant systems and some are dwarf systems, but the range in candle power is not great. For statistical purposes, they can all be considered as equally luminous. Therefore, their distances are correctly indicated by their apparent faintness. This property has been used to survey accurately the whole of the observable region out as far as telescopes can reach. The scale of the survey is so immense that a special unit of distance is employed in the reports. This unit is the light year, namely the distance light travels in a year going at the rate of 186,000 miles each second. The number of miles in a light year is 6 million million. In other words, 6 followed by 12 ciphers. Light reaches the Earth from the Moon in about 1 and a third seconds, from the Sun in about 8 minutes, from the nearest star in about 4 and a half years. This last figure is typical. The average distance between neighboring stars in our own system is several light years. The diameter of our system, which is one of the giant nebulae, is about 100,000 light years. The faintest nebulae that can be detected with the greatest telescope are, on the average, about 500 million light years away. We intercept and photograph today the light which left these stellar systems far back in a remote geological age. This light has been sweeping through space for millions of centuries, 
at the speed of 186,000 miles each second. Truly, as we look out into space, we look back into time. With the largest telescope, we can look out into space about 500 million light years in all directions. Thus, the observable region is a vast sphere about a thousand million light years in diameter with the observer at the center. Throughout this sphere are scattered about a hundred million nebulae, each a stellar system at some stage of its evolutional history. These nebulae average about 10,000 light years in diameter and about a hundred million times the brightness of the sun. The average distance between neighboring nebulae is about two million light years. A rough model of the observable region might be represented as follows. Assume that the sphere, a thousand million light years across, is reduced to a sphere with a diameter of one mile and a half. Then the hundred million nebulae are reduced to the size of golf balls, and they are scattered through the sphere at average intervals of about 30 feet. On this scale, the Earth could not be seen with a microscope, not even with an electron microscope. The nebulae are scattered singly, in groups, and even in clusters, but this irregularity is a minor detail. When very large volumes of space are compared, they are found to be remarkably alike. On the grand scale, the observable region is very much the same everywhere and in all directions. In other words, it is homogeneous. This feature could not be predicted. It is the first characteristic definitely established for our sample of the universe. Only one other general feature has been found. Light reaching us from the nebulae has lost energy in proportion to the distance it has traveled. The fact is established, but the explanation is still uncertain. The, the problem thus posed, which involves the possibility of an expanding universe, makes an exciting story in itself. It is mentioned now merely to complete the description of the observable region as known today. To summarize, the explorations of space have swept outward in three waves, through the system of the planets, through the stellar system, into the realm of the nebulae. In the first phase, the Earth was found to be one of the family of planets which circle the sun. In the second phase, the sun was found to be one of the millions of stars which make up our stellar system. In the third phase, our stellar system was found to be one of the millions of nebulae which are scattered rather evenly through the region of space that can be observed with telescopes. The next step involves some guesswork. We suppose that the region we have explored is like any other large region of space, that the observable region is a fair sample of the universe. With the aid of this assumption, we may discuss the universe on the basis of factual knowledge. Men are already assembling the types of possible universes which are consistent with the known facts. As more facts are discovered, the number of such universes will steadily decrease. Thus, step by step, we may hope to discard the possibilities and finally recognize the universe we actually inhabit. The venture stirs the imagination profoundly. It has become feasible only in our generation. With the aid of great telescopes, we have at last won our way beyond the stars of our system, out into the very depths of space. The explorations will continue. Still greater telescopes will be put into operation. And slowly, as the darkness recedes, the universe will loom forth. So if I can comment briefly, I found it rather surprising at the end that Hubble was not completely committed to an expanding universe. 
he said it's a fact that the farther away um, a stellar system is, the more the light coming to us loses energy, meaning it goes to longer wavelength. And I assumed he always was fully committed to that being caused by a Doppler effect because of expansion of the universe. Clearly not. Took, took another 10 years for him to come around. Any other comments? Makes you. Um, I, I enjoyed it from the fact that it, uh, the, the the circa forty mid forties was uh, an interesting time for him. Kind of nostalgic to listen to someone from that time. The uh, the expansion of the universe was still uh, still somewhat of a discussion. Nineteen forty five. If you remember, they presentation I had last year about, uh, you know, the expansion of the universe back in 45, it was still a, had two, uh, two competing major theories. Steady state in that, and it just, right. uh, and it, uh, it took a while. It took until late, like you said, late forties for the, for everybody to come around. George come was also involved in that and quite a, quite a, uh, quite a story itself. We should do a presentation on that. Actually, actually I want, we did. We did <laughs> last year. Let's, let's repeat it. Yeah. Uh, I wonder check, if, if check, Hubble check. ever thought that he would that there would be a telescope in space. Could he have ever imagined that? Do you think? That was before. That was before they. It was way before Sputnik. Before was, yeah. Right. Well, I think he could imagine it. I mean, science fiction was all over the idea of putting stuff up in the space. And it would be named for him as a different. Uh... Yeah, it's it's kind of awesome that it's named for him. Uh, but I will tell you, there's plenty of astronomers who would have liked to have him launched into space. I know that story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, let me comment on that. Um, Hubble's initial paper in 1929 came up with a Hubble constant. I don't know if he was so brazen as to name it for himself right away, but what came to be known as the Hubble constant was actually wrong by a factor of seven. Seven. Yep. Um, and as evidence began to come in that there was something wrong, he suppressed, uh, actively suppressed any but any other astronomer's view or publication that would suggest that he was wrong. <laughs> Not wrong in the general idea, but just wrong in terms of what the number was that characterized how far away things were and you know how fast they were moving away from us. Um, some of the factors that he suppressed were that the farther away you go, depending on how much dust and gas is in between us and a distant object, it makes it look fainter. He didn't want to listen to that. Um, lots of factors. So, uh, eventually. He ran. He he lost control as the evidence became overwhelming, and reality started to burst through. He, he he had a good start. I wish he hadn't been so egotistical about not wanting any any change in his initial number. You know. That's what he did, and he he teed off a lot of astronomers in the process. He went and spent a year or two or something like that in Great Britain and, and he cultivated a British accent and then yes. he always yeah. used it when he came back because that yep. was sort of high society right in that time and, and always wanted to have a pipe in his mouth when he was no question like about a, it. a father figure kind of thing. 
So the guy accomplished a lot, but he had an ego that he never, never stopped being hungry to feed it. Couldn't surmount it. Couldn't yeah. get over it. That sort of thing never happens in science. No, of course not. <laughs> No. And and this was, you know, one of the effects of this thing with the magnitude of the Hubble constant is it affects when you, you use the Hubble constant to figure out how old the universe is. And he was coming up with about 2 billion years for the age of the universe because his Hubble constant was off by a factor of seven. Right. <laughs> And, and and one of the ways that became an issue was geologists using radio uh, radio tracer studies began to think that the earth was more like four or five billion years old. And how could the earth be older than the universe? In the universe, right. Right? Yeah, that's it. The, so, the, so, the, Hubble, the Hubble constant is, is still being debated, and that's really... Where the uh, uh, the hypothesis for dark energy came from, okay, because it, it they couldn't explain some of the uh, mass age of the universe because, because of the uh, the changes of uh, the Hubble con the so called Hubble constant. Too well, much mass. That's true, but the kind of variability in what the real Hubble constant is, it's it's in the range of plus or minus, I don't know, a few percent or five plus or minus five percent or something like that. It's not plus or minus a factor of seven. No, right. no, no. Right, right. Nowhere near, right. That's a great, great story all by itself. It, another piece of the story is that it is largely an American story. Yes. The story of astronomy had been largely a European story. No question. And what changed that, and Ken has probably given a talk on this at some point in the past, I can't remember offhand, but was two things. The American industrial might and revolution that produced uber wealthy uh, individuals who had cash to, to, to donate to build new telescopes. And this uh, Ellery Hale. George Ellery Hale. Uh, yeah, George Ellery Hale, who had a knack for getting these guys to, to let's build a bigger one. That's how the 100-inch telescope got built. I think that's how the earlier 60-inch scope got built. Well, the 200-inch two, two, got got built because of his efforts. He just didn't, yeah, uh, sure. you know, he wasn't That's around you know, to see right. it. But. So those three telescopes, 60 inch, 100 inch, then 200 inch. Well, the 40 inch, the, the, the Yerkes telescope, Dale, was also his. Yeah, the biggest right. refractor. Okay. Refractor, was, sure. That's right. Those, That's those telescopes time. made this a largely an American story. Mm -hmm. Right. I guess the Yerkes, they all worked there, many of them. Uh, didn't uh, I know that George Harley Hale did, uh, but uh, he was in constant competition with things that, that Hubble were doing, was doing uh, just uh, it, at the later part of his life. Um, it, there was a lot of conflict between them. Uh, but, we well, but, but Ellery Hale enabled Hubble. Uh, absolutely, no question. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Great, great uh, movie, though. A lot of fun to look at. See, absolutely. Great feature. Um, what happened to Diane? I don't know. Uh, she had to log off. No explanation. Okay. Okay, so right. unless there's something I'm forgetting, um, this is yeah. sort of a break time, and we'll pick up in, I'm not sure exactly what time. What time is it now? It's 8.34. Why don't we say in 15 minutes? 
deal. Let's reconvene and you're welcome to shoot the breeze, talk about astronomy, whatever, until then. Great. What was that time, Dale? 8.50 will do. Yeah, 8.50. 850. 8.50, we're coming back. Thank you. I'm going to get some lunch, dinner, or whatever. All right, all. Um, as happens from time to time, I get called in to use my machine for doing work instead of enjoying the astronomy meeting. So I'll be on the back burner somewhere. If uh, I doubt they're going to get this issue solved before our meeting is over. So um, I will uh, try to be listening in on the side to the talks while. Uh, while the meeting's going on, but um, something being made into an emergency is the best way I can describe it. This is the back. This is the drawback for having an IT job where you can work from home, and that's where I happen to be. Um, had I gone out bowling and chimed in from there, I would have uh, told him I can't do it and sent him to the on call. So that's the way. It's going when it's going. Keep me here, boy. It's been into almost there. The big yard. Reflecting place. Awfully quiet in here tonight. So I have a question for the group. Um, so far, I do mostly uh, astrophotography, but I'd like to get a telescope for doing some visual stuff, and I'd like to get a Dobsonian, and I don't have one currently, and I really have only looked through one once or twice. Um, so I'm a bit of a newbie when it comes to that sort of thing. Uh, so I have a bit, a bit of aperture fever, <laughs> uh, and I'd like to get a fairly large one, but I'd love, also like to get something quality. So, but I don't want to use a ladder. What is your vehicle? I'm thinking I'm going to keep it at home. Okay. So I don't want to limit it. I have a small hatchback. My I, my wife has an SUV, but I don't plan on taking it around. Um, if I did, it would be a different purchase. You know, ten inch or something like that. I'm I'm thinking sixteen, eighteen, twenty. I don't know, somewhere in that range. 
So it's going to be a 200 pounder, you know, that kind of thing. Um, really fast mirrors now where you can get them where you don't need to be on the ladder, but right. Obviously you'd be collimating it uh, quite a bit. But don't you have to collimate them almost any, every time you use them anyway? Oh, I don't know about that. I think if it's, uh, you know, if it's, if it's well constructed, if you're not moving it a lot. Well, what if you do move it with the wheelbarrow? Let's say, you know, take it out of the garage using the wheelbarrow handles, flop it in the driveway, set it up. Yeah. Is it? I would think you could get away with doing that a few times without having a column eight, but from, I'm not a, um, a new owner, but okay. from what I've seen with a, uh, what do you call it, a Cheshire or a laser, you can collimate pretty quickly. Okay. So you don't have to have perfect seeing, and you can drop that laser collimator in there and tweak it and do it pretty quick. So I wouldn't let that stop me. Yeah. Well, I've looked for things. What are you, what are you planning? Um, what are your and, uh, go ahead. Yeah, what are, you, what are you planning to view primarily with it? Well, that's another question. You know, I live in Bortle four plus skies, so if I get a big one, is it going to be washed out? Yeah, dark skies matter big time, right? Yeah, when you get something big. One of the other things, I know this is not conventional wisdom, but one of the other things I was hoping to do is actually do some planetary imaging with it. So, you know, getting a go-to system that can track, you know, and take videos of Jupiter and Saturn and so forth. Um, I realize I'm not going to get long exposure stuff like, you know, nebula. That's that's difficult at best to do with the Dobsonian, but I figured for planetary work with the videos, I could do that. So, you know, getting something with the electronics and motors, you know, it adds a couple thousand dollars, two, three, four thousand, maybe depending on the size. Um, but I, from what I've seen, you seem to be able to add that to anything. I've seen some, what I thought were some decent scopes for sale used, maybe a bit of a drive, but uh, I don't know. I just, I don't know much about them, and I really haven't had much chance. You know, everybody's stuck at home COVID-wise and not really getting together. So, uh, I think a, um, Stargate's one, but... Yeah, at the at the uh, swap meet, there was a fellow from the Oakland Astronomy Club that was looking to sell a uh, large Absonian. I, I don't remember exactly which what it was. I want to say it might have been like a Starmaster. It was a good one. Um, the mirror came from out west, um, plus the mirror maker. Um, okay. Uh, I'm trying to think who would have. Saw one, yeah. was it Cloudy Nights? Some guys sound a 25 incher, um, yeah. huge behemoth in the in the Michigan, Detroit region. I didn't know if that he might was a club member. Yep. No, that could be him. Yeah. This was like eight grand. That's too big for, for what I'm looking yeah. to think. Yeah. I have a um. question. <laughs> if you go to really for for large aperture reflectors, if you go to a really low f number like f three, yeah, and you want to do visual observing, can typical eyepieces get a clear view with light coming in from such a large angle? Well, I think you'd need to use a paracore. Because you'd have significant uh, field yeah. curvature. Yeah. No. I think certain eyepieces work better in those than others, and that's a good question. My eyepieces may be, you know, the stuff I got might be really geared towards Schmidt-Cassegrain slow systems. I don't know. Yeah, you so, probably want an ethos or a delos or a good yeah. high quality IP. I'm set of a 68 so. degree uh, meads and a set of 82 degree uh, Axiom LX mm -hmm. eyepieces, as well as uh, a set of 60 degree cheaper stuff 
um, uh, the meads. So I don't have any Teleview stuff, but uh, my only uh, question is: Is your capacity going to be limited by Michigan seeing? Um, you know, one of the things is I, <laughs> I I presented. You know, I I I've been working with Jupiter here, and I'm just trying to get better resolution. I realize that you know at some point I'm just fighting the seeing so much that getting a bigger aperture is like, wow, man, you know, we went from an 11 inch mid grain to a, a 14 inch daub or a 16 inch daub. And it's like, it's a little bit better, but you know, if you put that daub in New Mexico, you'd be unbelievably better. Or even my current 11 inch, if I put that in, you know, the Caribbean or La Palma, I could get something amazingly better. It's just, but the conditions here, I think are, are killing it for, good good clear visual at long focal range like that i i remember at least 10 if not 15 years ago i was at an astronomy uh conference somewhere and there was a professional astronomer speaking and he had done a study of doing video astronomy with uh telescopes of various apertures I think he, he went up to two feet, 24 inch aperture. And he was uh, looking at some craters on the moon as his test case. Um, and what he found is the larger the aperture, the smaller the number of clear frames that you get. Okay. So to get a really sharp image, uh, you had to take way more video with a large aperture because maybe only one frame out of 10,000 was really clear where across the whole aperture, uh, the sky was stable. Okay. I, re I remember that conclusion that he came to. So if you well, want to look at Jupiter. Yeah. You'll probably have a similar experience if you go to a larger aperture. Well, you can do it. That, that's that's one aspect of it. I don't want to get a telescope just for you know looking at the big planets. That's that sound that's a bit extreme. But you know, with my Schmidt Cassegrain, I I really can't see nebula. It's too slow. It's zoomed in pretty good. Galaxies, you know, you pointed it Andromeda, which is pretty bright. Uh, you know, you want to see a little bit of the core, a little bit of the fuzzies. It's you can't, yeah, you can see, um, Orion, uh, a little bit, but you know, I need bigger aperture and faster focal ratio for me yeah, to be able to visually yeah. see these things. I have a, a, a nice quality, uh, 80 millimeter refractor, I use it almost exclusively for photography, but. Uh, it, you know, actually, ironically, I've had it for nine months, and I, I use it visually. Just the other day, I, I tried it out on Jupiter and Saturn, and some stars, and it was pretty crisp, but it didn't do better than the eleven inch, at least for the planets. So, well, well, Dale, I have one <laughs> answer for problem. you. Yeah, four to one skies. <laughs> There's when you're gonna see stuff visually that uh you image things so when you see them visually it's a whole different it's capturing the light in your eyes it's not going to look very you know the details are different visually visual astronomy is sometimes it's just about catching that little blob in the screen and say hey i saw light coming from this object it isn't so much about the details whereas uh as you know from all the great images you take when you put the camera sensor on it you see exactly what those images are for what they are and what you know how they look yeah um, invisible light and you know if you're using uh you know ha or sodium you can see what those structures look like the type of light that they're giving off our well, eyes visually, i do enjoy going to darker sky sites but 
you know, and we do travel some, but it's just few and far between when I get a chance. Yeah, and that's um, so I'm that's just looking part of for something at home, you know, a visual thing. Also, a little bit of outreach, you know, our neighbor kid. Um, we're trying to we're starting to teach him astronomy a little bit, and and um, some other people, Facebook friends, are interested. Like, hey, can I come over and look? So, I mean, you know, it's. They see pretty pictures, and unfortunately, they're going to be wow. I thought it would be brighter, but yeah, it's they are, some, you know, get them over while well there. Striking yeah. visual objects, globular clusters fall the, along the lines of good. That's true. Striking visual objects because you could they can see and count those stars. Yeah. Giant nebula, if you've got filters like O3 filters, um, those can get interesting. But you do you do need the filter the narrow band filters in order to make those look a little more interesting. Um, the Orion Nebula is uh, the cheat code for visual because without a filter and if it's dark enough, there's just so much detail there visually that um, even if it doesn't look like any of the pretty pictures, it's still gonna they're still gonna see a lot of things. Um, you know, I, I haven't Orion turned Nebula. my. Um my 80 millimeter refractor yet on a nebula i'd like I, I need to see what orion looks like through that yeah hey guys it, you will I, you will love it i hate to interrupt but it's time to get rolling here is diane here i don't see her okay <clears throat> well it's time to move on to our main presentation uh which will be given by jim shedlowski uh he's been a member i checked of the Warren Club for 20 years now. Um, and he likes to give a presentation each fall, I've noticed, um, often on topics of historical interest, such as the German rocket program during World War II, for example. I remember him doing that quite well. However, tonight he's going to look toward the future. His topic, the Giant Magellan Telescope. Jim, take it away. Thanks, Dale. Uh, if I'm uh, got to get the uh, thing fired up here, I've got the, uh, oops, I've got a. And let's ask everyone to mute who's not giving, you know, other than Jim. Yeah, hang, hang loose here for a second. Got to get into the. Okay, uh, you guys, uh, you're not seeing this yet, so let me, uh, let me get into the. Okay, I'm going to share here now. And uh, you guys, oh, just a second. Hang, hang loose for a second. Well, let's see. Are you seeing the slide? Yes, we are. Okay, I gotta now. I gotta get into the uh, presentation mode. If you can. Mm -hmm. Well, shucks, Dale, this didn't work. <laughs> Well, do it the way you've got it. We can see it. Okay. Jim. Well, I've, I've got a. It's going to make things a little difficult because I can't use some of the tools that uh, that I was hoping to. Uh, but let me, let me give me one more chance here. See if I can. Uh... Okay, can you see the slide now? I can see the slide. Okay, that's good. Then, then I'm I'm where I need to be. And uh, uh, let me get this thing here going. 
Okay, let me get your uh, the screen out of the way here. Your uh, speaking screen. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 13th annual SSC Shedlowski in September in Cranbrook Astronomy Presentation. So it was 13 years, Dale. This, this year, I'll discuss the Giant Magellan Telescope, one of the three current mega telescopes under construction, which, which will come online in the very near future. Okay. Try it. I'll start by briefly discussing and comparing these three telescopes and review the current state of the giant telescope world and then describe the giant Magellan telescope in more detail. But we might ask, why do we need giant telescopes anyway? Good question when they cost billions of dollars, are extremely complex and take a long time to build. The simple answer is two words, sensitivity and resolution. A more direct answer is that we wish to look at or gather more data from fainter objects and to see them in greater detail. Laser telescopes with modern complementing technology, excuse me, larger telescopes with modern complementing technologies are required to accomplish both of these goals. Some of you may recall this slide from my presentation several years ago in which I discussed the historical quest or improved sensitivity and resolution by technical improvements in telescopes from Galileo's one and an eighth inch homemade refractor to today's giant reflectors. Many of these improvements had to do with the size of these instruments. Some early principles discovered were first, by increasing the focal length, you could increase the power. And secondly, fainter objects could be seen by using larger objectives. The early pioneer astronomers learned to utilize these relationships and thus telescopes grew longer and fatter. These two parameters, the objective size and focal length still hold, but many other factors have entered the equation when seeking the extreme values of sensitivity and resolution demanded by today's astronomy. As telescopes grew larger, problems arose, which were addressed over the decades and centuries. Larger objective lenses introduced chromatic aberrations, which were reduced by making longer telescopes, or eventually eliminated by using parabolic mirrors as objectives. Mounting systems evolved and changed to support and control the heavier telescopes. Materials changed to address thermal expansion in the larger mirrors and so on and so forth. Finally, and another slide from my earlier presentation, at the turn of the 20th century, after the advent of photography, the introduction of spectroscopy, and the beginnings of the science of astrophysics with the discovery of the expanded scale of the universe by Edwin Hubble in 1923, which, which was enabled by the 100-inch hooker at Mount Wilson, which was one of George Ellery Hale's ever larger reflectors, the serious business of creating ever larger telescopes began. This period from 1908 to 1948 began with Hale's 60-inch reflector at Mount Wilson and ended with the 200-inch Hale telescope at Mount Palomar. The Hale telescope with its monstrous 200 inch mirror and huge but precision equatorial mount took over 20 years to complete. At an astronomical cost of $6 million, which is about $90 million in today, today's dollars, which was donated by the Rockefeller Foundation, a private entity. It would remain for nearly 45 years as the largest effective telescope in the world. It still remains active at Mount Palomar as a premier scientific instrument, but its 1948 dedication presaged an extended period of more than 45 years during which no comparable telescope was built. 
This 45-year-old hiatus of larger telescopes had to do with many factors because of the time and money required to emulate or surpass the 200-inch hail, a clear and focused initiative was required to champion such a project. The astronomy community of that period was philosophically splintered and lacked such a champion. Hale had died in 1938. Government support for large science projects finally became, began to become available in 1958 after Sputnik and the beginnings of the space program. But the indecisiveness of the astro community meant that it couldn't share in this largesse effectively due to the lack of the kind of focus enjoyed by the space race. Also, this was the area of transformation to digital photography. And by the mid 1960s, observatories were reporting gains of a factor of 10 over traditional film photography and improved detectors were much less expensive than larger mirrors. All was not lost, however. In this decades long period, as the missile competition followed by the space race spawned many advances in technology, which were later applied to enable larger and more sophisticated telescopes. A prime enabler was the development of faster and more competent and capable computers and computing applications. Computers precise digital control abilities enabled the use of the much simpler, more compact, less costly and lighter weight Alphaz mounting systems, which became the norm for larger telescopes after 1975. Fast computers permitted the practical development of the first adaptical optical system or adaptive optical system by the military in the 1980s, which were later declassified and made large ground-based telescopes more competitive. We'll talk more about adaptive optics later. Computer speed, technology, and miniaturization also revolutionized the field of digital in imaging. Creative thinking regards to the more efficient fabrication of lighter and primary mirror systems came on the scene. The multiple mirror telescope at Mount Hopkins in Arizona in 1979 demonstrated that with modern technology, digital technologies, a functional large telescope could be built by combining several smaller mirrors as segments of a larger primary. The advantages of high altitude sites to avoid much of the atmosphere and remote locations to reduce light pollution became an important consideration in future observatory planning and various alternatives became available. Much of this thinking came together in 1993 with the first Keck 10 meter telescope. When it became operational after Caltech was gifted $70 million by Howard Keck, son of Standard Oil Company's tycoon William Keck. Using the University of California, Jerry Nelson's innovative mirror technology to produce the world's first practical large segmented mirror telescope located on top of Mauna Kea at 13,600 feet elevation. It was the first fully operational telescope larger than the 200 inch hail in 45 years. In the next few years, it would soon be joined by a number of others using several varieties of light weighted mirror systems that which had been developed recently. All of these telescopes used the more efficient Altaz mounts. All were located at high altitude remote sites all of them had improved adaptive optic systems, and each of them used one of the light weighted mirror systems, which had been recently developed, enabled the down, enabling the downstream efficiencies of mass, cost, and size. These new generation post hail telescopes are shown on this chart, along with some historical references. You'll note in particular the 200 inch hail up here at uh, right here, the Hubble down here, and the Kex. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, there are two Kex. 
These new larger telescopes with enhanced capabilities built with relatively smaller investments inspired the professional astronomy community to begin thinking about even larger telescopes. By the end of the 20th century, with the, with the uh, successes of these larger telescopes raising new cosmological questions about such subjects as dark matter, dark energy, exoplanets, and the like, even larger telescopes were proposed to provide even greater resolution and sensitivity. After the astro astronomical dust had settled, three mega telescope or mega giant telescope programs were initiated and are currently underway. They are indicated in red. The, uh, the 39.3 meter European extremely large telescope, the 30 meter telescope or the TMT, and finally the 25 meter giant Magellan telescope. These three telescopes and their associated observatories will all dwarf their existing counterparts. They are projected to yield images that are 10 to 16 times more detailed than Hubble with huge increases in sensitivity due to their massive primary mirrors. Each telescope represents cutting edge technology as interpreted by separate teams of scientists and engineers. For practical handling for reasons, all of them required partitioned primary mirrors. The ELT, or the Extremely Large Telescope, and the TMT, or 30-meter telescope, are major extrapolations of the technology demonstrated by the Keck telescopes, while the GMT, or the Giant Magellan Telescope, Re represents extensions of technologies utilized and pioneered by the multiple mirror telescope and the large binocular telescope. I have chosen to more closely examine and discuss the GMT or the Giant Magellan Telescope due to its more modest extension of size and technology and its more conventional Gregorian optical design, somewhat more familiar to us amateurs. It's seven 8.4 meter monolithic mirrors compares to the 492 hexagonal segments on the 30 meter telescope or 798 segments on the extremely large telescope, which greatly reduces the complexity of controlling the ultra precise interfacing requirements for segmented mirrors. The Giant Magellan Telescope is a basically a Gregorian configuration telescope with a 24.5 meter diameter seven segment primary mirror on an Altaz mount. It is under construction in the Cerro Las Campanas at 8,500 feet at altitude in the Las Campanas Observatory in Chile's dry Atacama Desert, allowing measurements into the infrared. It is being built by an international consortium of universities and research institutions under the auspices of the U.S. National Science Foundation at a cost of over $2 billion and is scheduled to begin operations in 2029. It will have a resolution of 10 times that of Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope, and a sensitivity that is five times that of today's largest ground-based telescopes. While it shares the advanced technologies with its mega giant sisters, it is unique in a number of respects. Let us start with a 24.5 meter primary mirror, which consists of an 8.4 meter central parabolic segment surrounded by six 8.4 meter aspheric parabolic wing segments. Each of these segments were, were or are being produced by the Keras Mir Lab beneath the University of Arizona's football stadium on their campus in Tucson, Arizona. An important feature of each of these mirrors is their enhanced honeycomb structure, which translates into lightweight for high structural or with high structural stiffness. Each of these 8.4 meter mirrors weighs about 12 and a half tons, as opposed to the 14.5 or 
for 14 and a half tons for the much smaller five meter hail primary telescope that's on the 200 inch, which is also honeycomb. Their thin honeycomb sections means that the overall mirror volume is 80% hollow, which also translates into thermal efficiency or the ability to achieve temperature equilibrium while operating quicker. These mirrors are spun cast in a rotating furnace or kiln, which imparts a natural parabolic surface in the process, saving time and effort when producing the final figure and polished surface. The technology for producing these highly efficient giant mirrors was developed by Dr. Roger Angel at the University of Arizona who for this innovation was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in 2016, joining Thomas Edison and the Wright brothers, among others. The mirrors are then given their final precise surfacing operations at the mirror lab, a process which takes several years. The first of the Giant Magellan Telescope seven mirrors was cast in March of 2005, and the sixth was cast in March of this year of 2021. With two of the seven mirrors are complete and in storage and three are at various stages of surfacing and polishing. Since the GMT or the Giant Magellan Telescope's op optical design is of a Gregorian configuration, it calls for an overall surface of its primary mirror to be a paraboloid. With the segmented mirror design of the GMT, a unique challenge presents itself. In, over, in order for the overall mirror to have a paraboloid surface required to optically focus the parallel rays of life, light, the six off-axis off wing mirrors must be slightly flatter, but by a very precise amount. These six aspheric mirrors require an additional surfacing operation to remove up to 14 millimeters of material from their surfaces, as opposed to their paraboloidal central sister mirror. This must be done in a very precise manner and require new technologies to do the grinding and polishing and special metrology to be developed for measuring the resulting potato chip surfaces. The overall surface is accurate to within a plus or minus 25 nanometers, or to within an inch height if it were measured across North America. In order for any segmented mirror, that's any segmented mirror, to act as a consolidated coherent surface, it is optically critical that the segment boundaries be aligned to within a small fraction of the observed wavelength of light. This condition is termed as the phasing of the mirror segments, and this condition must be maintained for all operating conditions of wind, vibration, temperature, or gravity vectors as the, as the telescope moves through its motions, both in altitude and azimuth. The Giant Magellan Telescope primary mirror has 12 of these boundaries, which are measured with great precision and phasing is accomplished by pneumatic actuators and the active mounting system of each mirror segment. The same type of precision active mounting system is also required on each of the 30 meter, tier, 30 meter telescopes, 492 mirrors, with more than 1,400 boundaries to be continually monitored and phased precisely. The same thing is true of the uh, European uh, Extremely Large Telescope. It has 798 segments or some 2,300 boundaries that have to be measured and continually adjusted. As if the primary mirror of the Giant Magellan Telescope wasn't complex enough with its seven mirror segments, the secondary mirror is even more complicated. Since in addition to focusing the photons from the primary mirror, it is also the heart of the advanced level adaptive optic system. This unique secondary assembly consists of seven 1.1 meter 
uh, one one point meter, one point one meter segments, one for each of the primary segments, making it the world's first doubly segmented mirror telescope. The mirror in each of these segments is an extremely thin two millimeter thick sheet of glass with 700 or 675 voice coils. This little piece of glass here, two millimeters thick. With seven, 675 voice coil actuators bonded to its back, which can pull or push on a mirror at over 1,000 times per second, deforming it to correct for wavefront distortions caused by atmospheric turbulence. This more efficient configuration allows for more precise control and better light throughput than the earlier adaptive optic systems which use a single additional deformable mirror in the optical train. The field of adaptive optics has, has evolved into a science in and of itself with the co correction performance, with the correction performance dependent on the wavelength being measured, the position and magnitude of the target, the field of view required, and many other factors as well as the design of the adaptive optic system. The Giant Magellan Telescope adaptive optic system is designed to operate with both a natural guide star and or six laser generated artificial guide stars, as well as a cutting edge ground layer adaptive optics mode. In September of 2020, the Giant Magellan Telescope uh, Corporation received an, a $17.5 million grant from the National Science Foundation specifically to accelerate the development of these advanced concepts in adaptive optics. The resolution improvement for this advanced optic system is shown in comparisons with the Hubble Space Telescope, the Gemini 8-meter ground-based telescope with adaptive optics, and finally, with the Giant Magellan Telescope. An alternate interchangeable seven segment secondary mirror assembly with the same optical prescription, but without deformable mirrors will also be available for operations in a non-adaptive optics mode. As is shown in this optical diagram of the Giant Magellan Telescope, the image is sent from the secondary mirror assembly to the Gregorian focus location just behind the primary mirror through an opening in the central segment of the primary. This use of the prime focus station for most operating modes differs from most other large segmented mirror telescopes, which use an additional mirror to a NASMITH focus point sideways through the altitude axis. On the Giant Magellan Telescope, the final image is delivered to any of a number of instruments mounted on the rotatable assembly near the Gregorian focus called the Gregorian Instrument Rotator. Changes between instruments can be accomplished in 15 minutes or less. This whole assembly is mounted on the telescope's optical axis and rotates independently to compensate for field rotation caused by the ALTAS tracking of the telescope and is an integral part of the telescope's structure and optical train. A variety of optical and infrared spectrometers and imagers are under design and development as first generation instruments for the Giant Magellan Telescope. Second generation instruments are also under study and will be selected by the Giant Magellan Telescope Scientific Advisory Committee as operational status approaches. The Giant Magellan Telescope's very fast primary mirror, which is an F.71, yields a short or 18.2 meter focal length, which permits a relatively compact and structurally stiff design architecture. The telescope structure is integrated into the ALTAS mount system which is mounted on an isolated and earthquake-proof pier. The precision bearing surface float on an oil film only 50 microns thick. The Giant Magellan Telescope with overall compact packaging 
lightweight mirrors, more efficient Altaz mount, and the use of modern design and materials weighs less than twice that of the Hale 200 inch at Mount Palomar, while providing nearly 20 times the light collecting ability. The Giant Magellan, Tel the Giant Magellan Telescope site is located in the southern reaches of the Atacama Desert in northern Chile, one of the driest places on the planet, on, on Mount Campanus or Cerro Campanus, which at 8,500 feet is the highest point in the Los Campanus Observatory, home of the twin 6.5 meter Magellan telescopes. The high altitude and dry air, dry air, dry air atmosphere will enhance its observations into the infrared. The rectangular 22-story high cavernous enclosure was patterned after several of its predecessors, the multi-mirror telescope and the, the large binocular telescope, an indication of its Arizona heritage. The oversized structure is designed to protect the telescope from dust, the sun, and the weather. At night during operation, it tries to disappear by opening its massive vents to allow airflow to equalize the temperature inside to that outside as quickly as possible. With a resolving power 10 times that of Hubble and a sensitivity of five times that of Keck, the current largest ground-based telescope, the giant Magellan telescope will be able to see and measure much fainter and deeper astronomical objects in greater detail than ever before. Its ability to use high definition spectroscopy and make sp spatial and radial velocity measurements with much greater precision and sensitivity will advance our knowledge of exoplanets, the birth and death of stars, and of galaxy formation. It will also expand our understanding of the 95% of the universe made up of those mysterious and pervasive quantities, dark matter and dark energy. Finally, it will probe more deeply into the nature of that earliest period after the Big Bang, when the first objects appeared. And to quote a page from the Giant Magellan Telescope's Science Driver play Playbook, quote, Historical experiences shows that large increases in light collecting area have opened new observational discovery space and have led to unanticipated breakthroughs. This fact alone is a key driver for the next generation of telescopes." End of quote. And this orchestrated effort by the world of science to more completely understand our universe the Giant Magellan Telescope will co cooperate with institutions around the world and in space. A key initiative from the UN United States in those efforts is known as the United States Extremely Large Telescope Program, the US ELTP, as opposed to the European Extremely Large Telescope. This program is the initiative of a, a an organization called the Neuer Lab, or the NOIR Lab, the National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory, which is the National Science Foundation's center for operating and directing the activities of all Americans, American national observatories, such as Kitt Peak and Cerro Tololo and the Vera Rubin Observatory. The Neuer Lab, based in Tucson, Arizona, through this pro program is charged with providing U.S. astronomers with at least 25% of the observing time on each of the world's two largest telescopes, the GMT, covering the Southern Hemisphere from Los Campanas, and the 30-meter telescope covering the Northern Hemisphere from Mauna Kea, Hawaii. It is accomplishing these tasks by providing the National Science Foundation's funding and investment for the constructions, construction and operation of both of these observatories. This bi-hemispheric two telescope US ELT program will offer US astronomers scientific advantages in the future mega telescope era by the coordination of features and instrumentation on the two telescopes. It will provide a substantial 
nearly 50% sky overlap, enabling complementary or simultaneous observations with both telescopes. I would further suggest also that since these two telescopes are, are of a very different and somewhat competing design concept, both optically and structurally, they will provide profound guidance for the next generation of even larger ground-based telescopes of the future. So, what is the current status of the GMT? In spite of delays brought on by the COVID pandemic, progress, progress continues on the GMT. As of March 6, 2021, the sixth of the huge 8.4 meter mirror segments was cast in Tucson, with several years to go of figuring and polishing it ahead. These unique mirrors, which are now in storage in Tucson, Arizona, provide the critical path for the completion of the observatory. The site pre preparation at Los Campanas is well underway, and in October of 2019, a $135 million contract was awarded for the construction of the 1,800-ton precision telescope structure which is currently underway in Bremen, Germany and Rockford, Illinois. The $17.5 National Science Foundation special grant, which I mentioned earlier in, in September of 2019, has accelerated the creation of a sophisticated test fixtures and simulators in Tucson to validate the unprecedented adaptive optic system to be used on the Giant Magellan Telescope. The current plan for the telescope is to see first light in 2029 with four mirrors and to achieve its full seven mirror performance in the early 2030s. In conclusion, I'd like to go back to my opening statement about what is the justification for ever larger telescopes. That it is increased resolution and sensitivity I'd like to share with you some interesting data that I recently came across in an excellent presentation to the Philosophic Society of Washington by James Fanson, the project manager of the Giant Magellan Telescope, where he analyzes how these parameters have improved over the more than 400 years since Galileo. I have borrowed a slide from his presentation which captures how this has profoundly affected our understanding of our universe, beginning modestly with Galileo's discovery, if you will, of the solar system with his one and an eighth inch telescope with which he, quote, discovered the solar system. Two, Edwin Hubble's spectacular discovery of the expanded universe in 1923 with his observations using the 100 inch Hooker telescope at Mount Wilson. It is easy to speculate how these order of magnitude increases in both resolution and sensitivity by the, gen the giant Magellan telescope and its sisters will result in major discoveries in the decades to come and perhaps solve many of the cosmological mysteries which now confound us, like dark matter, dark energy, and what's it all about, Alfie? I'd like to close now with a musical interlude using a remodified version of the old Mac Davis song, which I used a couple of years ago, along with some online references for any of you who might be interested in learning more about this exciting project. I'd be happy then to take a few questions. And Dale, if you'll kind of monitor the sound here on this. Sing along pretty if you'd like, only make sure you're muted first. With telescopes, you can't become when you look at things so far away. You need a big mirror not to fumble and to get better data each day. Your detector, it needs lots of photons. 
from the galaxies away out in space. So you need a big scope to be spot on when you're in the astronomy race. In Tucson, they've got a small factory that makes great big telescope mirrors. More than eight meters wide, quite exactly. And spin them to almost a sphere paraboloid, really. They put seven of them all together to make a huge reflecting place. More than 80 feet wide, they're lined up side by side to look deeper and further in space. Cause with telescopes, you can't be humble. When you look at things so far away, need a big mirror to fumble. And to get better data each day, your detector, it needs lots of photons from the galaxies away out in space. So you want a big scope to be spot on when you're in the astronomy race. Cause with telescopes you can't be humble when you're in the astronomy race. Thank you all. Thank you, Jim. That was a good presentation. I do have a question. Yes, sir. So it's a little slightly off topic, perhaps, but you discussed the 30 million, uh, 30 meter telescope also. All um, right. Did you, did you do much research on the current status of that? I know there was a lot of controversy and delays in, you know, getting permission to build that on location in Hawaii. Yeah, and you're, you're, you're probably aware of the fact that uh, I'm trying to get, uh, get, you guys are, well, I'm, I'm not showing you the right screen here now. Uh, now let me find it here. There, there we go. No, that's not it. Uh, well, uh, in any event, the 30 meter telescope actually the 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 first telescope that will come on uh, online will be the european extremely large telescope oh okay and i believe that's scheduled for 2026 or 27 okay. and the 30 meter is about a uh, is about uh, a a year after that and then finally the giant magellan telescope these were all planned for earlier, but delays and, and issues and COVID right. they, pushed everything. They were all centrally approved and, and became uh, real programs way back at the beginning of the 20th century, or 21st century. So okay. I'm Dale, I'm trying to get back to uh, the, the presentation and I'm not sure how to do it here. If I, uh, you want to share it again? No, I'm I'm trying to. I, I'm such a clutch here. I, I'm trying. I, I all I'm looking at is my. Well, here we, maybe this will work. Uh, no, that didn't work either. So, I'm unless I'm, unless you close it out. Alt Tab is your friend. <laughs> if I do what now? Unless you close it out oh, already, oh, Alt Tab oh, is your friend. Yeah, Alt Tab. Let me see here. It says I'm not even signed up here now. Let's see. Uh oh. Uh, you, you can still hear me, though. I I guess I'm still signed in, right? Yeah, I can, can hear, you hear you. me. I can see you too. Yep, I hear you. See, you're still sharing your desktop. Hmm. Well, so I, I got a follow on I, question. I, I know that the James Webb telescope is going up, and that's focusing on a certain bandwidth of the spectrum, which is somewhat visual, but I think mostly infrared. Mostly infrared, right. Will, will this, uh, Jim, 
Will the GM team? Go ahead. Go ahead. Jim, you need to stop sharing. Well, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. That's what I was just oh. talking with Dale about. I, I you might know. have to go up to the top of your screen, the upper yep. screen. It okay, says okay, cool. well, maybe, maybe. Oh, oh yeah, oh, here, oh, we yeah. Go. here we go. Just, just, sec just a second, I found out. I've got a monitor going, so I have to stop sharing. Here we go. There you go. All right, Th thank you for reminding mm -hmm. me. Not so a problem. Is, okay. is the GMT, Is the sort of the spectrum that it looks at really, is it just dependent on the instruments? It is going into the infrared, into the first part of the infrared. The James Webb will be primarily infrared going into just into the visible. Okay. They kind of overlap slightly. Yeah. And those two guys, yes. that were, two guys that were on the screen, was that you and your brother? It was, and I didn't mean. Well, is that still up there? Oh gosh! No, it's Sorry. Not. Yeah, that, that, no, it's, that's not. My it's gone. Brother. Brother. It's gone. <laughs> that was my brother and I in 1958. Looking dude. I'm sorry. Looking dudes. Oh, thanks. Haven't Any other? Uh, haven't changed a bit, Jim. <laughs> Uh, right, exactly. Listen, we, you guys. Shortly after that picture was taken, we were on American Bandstand in Philadelphia. Ski Brothers, right? The Ski Brothers, right. Any other questions? The, the website that I posted uh, at the at the end there, if you if you want further information, there's there's a lot of great great information about all three of these huge telescopes now and uh they're they're quite fascinating to read how they developed and how the decisions were made and and uh, the technology behind them and so on and so forth there was a uh, there was the european extremely large telescope which is uh, what i say 39 mir meters was first uh conceived as, as something called the overwhelmingly large telescope, which was going to be 100 meters. But somebody came to their senses, I think, way back and uh, decided that was kind of a, a big reach or a mega reach. Yeah, I think it's interesting that none of these three new designs is guaranteed to perform to spec I'm, I'm sure they will all be nice telescopes, but when you, when you do something this far beyond what's been done before, especially with the European telescope that has so many pieces of glass, right? Um, you can't be sure that it's going to work as well as is hoped. And you got you got to have. Uh, I guess you have to have a lot of faith in uh, in. Uh, in computers and synthesis, uh, synthesizing these things ahead of time. Technology, well, technology just rules. Think of, just, just think, think of the amount, amount the amount of money involved. And but one thing that kind of uh, got me, I was reading a little bit last week about the, the, the Webb telescope. Now that is costing like ten billion dollars, not not two billion, but ten billion dollars. It has a projected lifetime of five years, only five years, with uh, with enough fuel, they say, perhaps to keep it going up to 10 years. These ground-based telescopes, they're like the giant Magellan telescope has a projected 50-year lifetime and probably will go on longer if it's still functional. But it seems like the James Webb, you know, you talk about a reach, and uh, James Webb probably is a bigger reach than than any of these three. Let's just cross our fingers when it when it uh, takes off here in December. Well, let me uh, say I've texted with Diane, and she says she apologizes, but she had to take off to take care of something urgent sure. that came up. 
Any Anyhow, other questions? Great presentation as usual, Jim. Great job. Thank, thank you, Ken. Yeah, I was oh, listening I, to the I presentation a, while working. I have a question for Dale or the rest of you. Did the music come across reasonably this time? Very yes, nicely, did, actually. Did. Yeah, actually, it was great this time. The last time it was really kind of sketchy. This time it was really, really good. You fixed well, thank it. Dale Park, thank Dale Parton for the suggestion. Well, we'll give him another reward for that. Good going, Dale. <laughs> yeah, 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 reelect him. <laughs> Is it? Hey, Dale. Yeah. Put me down for next summer, December's uh, Cranbrook, please. Or oh, excuse me, next, next, next September's. September. Yeah, I don't have a subject yet, but I'll find one. I'm sure you will. <laughs> September 2022. Thank you. We also have a comment in chat about a lot of earthquakes <laughs> in Chile. Right, and that's a design consideration of that. I mentioned that on that one slide, the uh, the pier for this telescope is mounted on an earthquake proof uh, contraption that essentially it will withstand uh, any earthquake that has ever been experienced on earth. Very good. Well, if the earth splits out from under it, all bets are off, but I don't see that yeah. happening. Yeah, if we have if we have a big asteroid crashed, I I guess the bets are off. <laughs> what if we get hit by Thea again? <laughs> well, cl climate change won't affect it. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. And, and then somebody mentioned the 30 meter telescope uh, recently. The uh, uh, the you know the controversy there had to do with John Blum's. Uh, homeland over in in, uh, in the Pacific, for it held it up. Actually, actual construction by about five years for the uh, get the, the approval of, of it as a site. But most of the work went on with that telescope program anyhow. So, well, that was, well, that was my, my question. question. You know, has, has that, that uh, is it halted? Is is the response, the response that, that actually might, might simply, simply you know, not be allowed like, like, to monitor. Dale, you, you need to turn your, turn your speaker, speaker down. down. We're, We're getting, getting a huge echo when you talk. Yeah. yeah. Whenever, Whenever I hear a huge, huge echo, echo, I haven't been back to start announcing, announcing baseball, baseball players like, like they do at the stadium. By the way, now. All of All these big telescopes, by the way, they project will be able to uh, do spectroscopy on atmospheres of exoplanets. They'll actually be able to get chemical signatures from at at any atmospheres around any of the 4,000 uh, exoplanets that Bob talked about earlier. Uh, Jim, I... Uh... I went, you know, I'm an alumnus of the University of Arizona. And when I went to visit, I've, I've, I've been in that lab several times. And, I have too. And it's, it's really, it's worth the trip. It really is it a terrific ab place. Ab absolutely is. It's an amazing factory. Yep. And it's been there for, it's really been there for, for many years. Even while I was at school, there was a lab down there as well in the 60s. So. Yeah, I know that they started this stuff, you know, much more recently, but it is worth the trip. Don't just don't go see the Arizona football team afterward. They don't do very well. <laughs> so, so here's a here's question. A... Um, the giant Magellan telescope is having its seven mirrors produced in Arizona. What about these hundreds of smaller mirrors for the other two big telescopes? Where are they being produced? Do you know? Well, the European extremely large telescope are being produced in Europe. I'm not sure where exactly, Dale. Uh, and I believe the 30 meter telescopes are being produced in Europe too, but I'm not certain of that either. So, but the, the production of those is 
have been going on now. They they've got because there's so many of them. They're producing like 10% more than the telescope actually needs because they they project that we, they will be changing a segment every week for for those two big telescopes. So they they'll have replacements for you know for each ring of the telescope. Why so often? Well, when you got five hundred of them, that's or or seven hundred so every ten years. You swap them out, clean yeah. service. I guess that's it. Yep. Last time I was in Hawaii, I went to the Keck Observatory, and we were talking a little bit about that to the called him the curator of the docent or whatever, and he had mentioned about them swapping things in and out on the new one, and. Uh, I'd ask a similar question, you know, why would you do that? Well, you know, for just for maintenance. But there's so many of them, it's it's almost like they wouldn't notice just if you took one out. I, would you have a little diffraction aberration? You know, with a what? of objects, you could probably just cancel that thing out, really. But again, but, the, um, the, yeah, this, this I think that's phasing of mirror phasing of mirrors is is extremely critical. And so uh that's been accounted for in the design. I just had a suggestion, Dale. Why don't why didn't somebody else pick a uh, one of those other two telescopes to do a presentation on it? Might be an interesting to answer some of these other questions. Well, Jim, maybe you could give us an update next September and focus on the other two telescopes. Well, let me think of that. <laughs> You're our resident expert. <laughs> nobody do it better than nobody do it better than you. Thank you all for attending tonight. Great meeting as always. <laughs> well, Dale, I, guess, I think you're you're the guy that's got to close the meeting, right? I guess I am. Um, <laughs> been great you guys uh almost hate to end it you know but all good things come to an end i guess so thank you again jim and dale thank for you your all. presentation dale teamy and good night everyone see you thursday yes yeah, see you see thursday. Thursday. See you thursday thursday do it all, all over, over again. again yeah all over again take care everybody there's still there's an still echo. echo good night, good night. Oh well. oh well. The echo was someone else. <laughs> yeah. Good night.